Hello everybody, how are you this morning? I know a lot of you came this morning just to see me. Right? <laughs> Probably. Well, good morning and welcome to Fletcher Chapel. We're glad to see you all this morning. Uh, looks like the weather and COVID and everything else has brought down the numbers again, but we're going to enjoy this morning and, and worship the Lord together. Does that sound good? I like that idea. We love that. And we're going to sing one of my favorite songs, and it's called Jesus Loves Me, and it's on page 490, but is there any announcements anybody would like to make? No announcements? Hey, Paul. Thank you for coming this morning. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. You're welcome. He's going to sing pretty. Oh, yeah, I bet he does. I sing pretty, too. Well, sometimes. You sing like a skunk. Well, a skunk sings pretty. Yeah, sometimes. Okay, let's go to page 490, and we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. Sing it real loud, because you all know this song. sing Jesus loves you your way yeah can I do that you care if she sings it her way I don't think they care I'll let you I gotta get on that stand though because Susie has to hang on to me because I'm a handful okay I'm gonna sing Jesus loves me the way I like to sing Jesus loves me Jesus loves me this I know Okay. Okay. Say bye. Bye bye. Okay. 
Okay, if you'll bow with me, we'll do the invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather in your house. We're so grateful, dear God, that we can look up to you and worship and not be afraid to mention your name out loud. Dear God, we ask that you be with each individual that's here. Wrap your arms around them and maybe they'll take something from the service that has been weighing on their heart that they can take with them and feel uplifted. We ask, dear God, that you just be with those who are unable to be here for whatever reason today. We ask this in our precious Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If we'll pay, turn to page 240, we'll sing, Love Lifted Me. 240. Hey, I, I want to sing, I want to sing, let me out, let me out. I'm coming, 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 I'm
Like, so, stuck. You're stuck. Yeah, you are. How are we going to get you loose? Crank my tail. Crank your tail? I did all the damage I can do. I think you did too. I'm gonna to put you down here with Rosie. She stinks. Well, I know, but <laughs> Rosie, don't you do anything to make me wish I had come down here. Rosie, why? Well, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here. That's exactly it. Okay, you guys be still. I think they'll behave for us. This morning, is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Give me some feet room here, I'll be stepping on Rosie and then she'll be stinking. It is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost and the title of my message this morning might be really familiar with some of you. It's called Jesus Feeds the 5,000. The scripture sentence, pretty much, that I'm gonna read is a small sentence, but it's a powerful sentence. And it is from Matthew 14, verse 16. And I will read that from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Although it's a small line in the scripture, it's a powerful one. And may God bless the reading of his holy word. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, it's written, At the time Herod, the ruler of Galilee, heard the reports about Jesus. So Herod said to his servants, Jesus is really John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why he's able to do these miracles. Sometime before this, Herod had arrested John. He tied him up and he put him into prison. Herod did this because of Herodias. Herodias was the wife of Philip, which is Herod's brother. Herod arrested John the Baptist because John told Herod, it's not right for you to have Herodias. <clears throat> well, Herod right then and there wanted to kill John. But Herod was afraid of the people. The people they believed that John was a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for Herod and his guest. Herod, oh, he was very pleased with her. So Herod promised he would give her anything she wanted. Well, Herodias told her daughter what to ask for. So Herodias' daughter said to Herod, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The King Herod, he was very sad, but he had promised to give her anything she wanted. The people eating with Herod had heard his promise. So Herod, he sent men to the prison and ordered them to cut off John's head. The men brought back John's head on a platter and gave it to the girl. She then took the platter and she gave it to her mother. The people that were followers of John the Baptist, they came and they got his body and they buried it. After they buried John the Baptist, they went and they told Jesus what had happened. When Jesus heard what had happened to John, Jesus, he left in a boat. Jesus went to a lonely place by himself. <clears throat> well, when the crowds heard about it, they followed Jesus on foot from the towns. When Jesus arrived, he saw a large crowd. Jesus, he felt sorry for them, and he healed those who were sick. Late that afternoon, Jesus' disciples came to Jesus and they said, no one lives in this place. And it's already late. Send the people away so they can go to towns and buy food for themselves. 
Jesus answered, they don't need to go away. You give them some food to eat. The disciples answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus said, bring the bread and the fish to me. Jesus told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves of bread and the two fish. Then Jesus looked to heaven and he thanked God for the food. Jesus divided the loaves of bread. Jesus gave the divided loaves of bread to his disciples. The disciples then gave the bread to the people. All the people ate and were satisfied. After they finished eating, the disciples filled 12 baskets with the pieces of food that were left over and not eaten. There were about 5,000 men there who ate, as well as women and children. This is the only miracle of Jesus that is included in all four Gospels. <clears throat> this story was not a sermon. This story was not a parable. This story is a story that is filled with activity. Was this story mentioned in all four Gospels because there was a lesson embedded in it? The lesson embedded in the story is about meeting human needs. Meeting human needs has its own lasting impact. One of the other factors about the stories was it was huge. It was a huge story because of the number of people that were in the story. Most of Jesus' ministry only involved a few people at a time. In this story, there were 5,000 men and women and children. Plus, the story had action in it. Jesus saw. Jesus had compassion. Jesus ordered. Jesus took. Jesus looked. Jesus blessed. Jesus broke. And Jesus gave. Think about this. Although this story is huge, look at how many people were involved. In the this very beginning of the story, we are told that Jesus was trying to find some time alone. Jesus retreated off by himself. Jesus tries to retreat to be alone. As Jesus is trying to retreat to a deserted place, Jesus' followers are literally following behind him. The crowd of people are following Jesus. They don't even realize that they are following Jesus longer and further than they'd ever expected. No one even bothered to pack a sandwich or something to eat. They didn't think about that. They were following Jesus. The people had no idea how far Jesus was going. These people hungered to follow Jesus Christ. Even though their tummies were probably growling, the people weren't complaining about being hungry. Scripture doesn't say that. It was Jesus' disciples that became concerned that it was getting late and there, was, that's, there were not nowhere for the people to get and buy food. The disciples were concerned. The people were satisfied to continue following Jesus. Jesus represents to them a different kind of fullness. One commentary that I read said the disciples may have been generally concerned with dinner. They wanted to send the crowds away so that they could get something to eat. Sending the crowds away sounded like the disciples did not want to get terribly involved. There was an ongoing tension here, a huge crowd, an unmet need. Oh my goodness, the sense of being overwhelmed. Could you imagine looking out at all those people and knowing they need to be fed? This may have been how the disciples were confessing of their powerlessness in the face of such a large scale need. Plus they needed to get the need out of their sight. 
Jesus responded to the disciples. Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples are responsible to feed the hungry. Even the size of the task is overwhelming to them. Too often the disciples wanted unmet needs to just go away. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus responds by drawing nearer to the need. This story is powerful. This story demonstrates that God is love. This story teaches us what it means to follow Jesus Christ. This story assures us of God's power for good in the world. First and foremost, this story teaches us that God is love. Jesus has compassion. Compassion for the people was Jesus' prime motivation. Jesus cares about our most basic needs. God is the ultimate power of the universe. God intends peace in the world. God intends to end the hunger. God intends the well-being of families. God intends for everyone to have spiritual wholeness. We have also learned in the scripture what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have an awesome responsibility for God that he's entrusted with us. Jesus did not feed the 5,000. Jesus did the miracle. Jesus told the disciples to feed the 5,000. God has entrusted us to be the body of Christ. We are the hands and the feet through which God's work is done in the world. God works through people like you and me. When we follow Jesus, we express our faith in Jesus Christ to others. We show acts of love. We show acts of justice. We show compassion towards others. It is no accident that the book of Matthew tells us that we will meet Jesus in reaching out to the least of our brothers and sisters. That would be the hungry, the thirsty, and the imprisoned. This gospel story reminds us that when we need it most, God will give us the power to work for good in the world around us. Have you faced a situation you were not sure you could handle? I'm sure some of you right now are searching back in your mind of that situation that hit you. It hit you hard. I have one that commonly smacks me upside the head when I think about a situation I didn't know what to do. It was a, at that time, it was a scary situation for me. I felt lost. I felt alone. I felt scared. I felt every emotion under the book. I really did. And when I finally caught my breath enough to come to my senses, I took it to God. I was praying, I, I was praying, I was just crying out to him to help me because I could not do it alone. I was by myself. I had no clue what to do. I had no clue where to start. Help me, help me now. I stood there and I cried. At that point in time, I was leaning over a deep freezer in a back room of a house with my elbows on it, and I was crying to God. He doesn't care where we talk to him at. He listens. If you've got something in you that you need to talk to God about, bring it to him. Bring it to him. 
You would not believe the calmness that came over me after I took it to him. Before I went to him, I was pretty much hysterical. Of course, nobody seen it because I was by myself, except God. And he's like, okay, I'll just wait until she wants to talk to me about it. <laughs> and when I did, what a relief. And it was, it was simple. What seemed so overwhelming was just simple. But at the time, in my mind, in my heart, no way could a little person like me do that by myself. I needed help. But God's there. We just need to take it to him. So when I ask, have you faced a situation you were not sure you could handle? I know some of you have got reflection on that. <coughs> did you find you got through it? I did. God took my hand. That wasn't enough. Actually, he picked me up and he carried me. I needed more than just a hand. I needed it picked up. You can be pretty certain that God was right there with you all the time when you were going through your situation. The disciples, they're looking at these people and they are feed, they're feeding them, but they're overwhelmed. That's 5,000 people. You're, look at you guys. You're just a few handful in here. What if this was packed with 5,000 people? We couldn't breathe. <laughs> It'd be so tight. But the disciples, they got through it. The disciples, they worked together and they followed Jesus. The disciples found that they had more than enough. This was not the first time the disciples have discovered the power of the Holy Spirit to do great things when Christians join together in unity and faithfulness to God's good purposes in the world. The promise in this story is if we join together in unity and faithfulness, God will be with us. We have given a promise that God will be with us. We have been given a promise that God's intention for love and peace and justice in the world will ultimately prevail. We know that it is a, a promise that Jesus kept with the disciples on that hillside in Galilee. We know that it is a promise that has been kept with God's faithful people over the centuries. We know that it is a promise that will be kept with us. I tell you folks, if you're ever in doubt of something, pick up your Holy Bible. If you don't have a Holy Bible, I'm sure you've got a friend that's got one laying around. It may be covered with dust, but pick it up and look at it. There is not an answer that's not in here. You just got to look and you got to read because God has given us what Rosie, my skunk, calls. This is God's love letter to us. It's not a one-page letter saying, I love you. It's a whole book. A whole book. As I close out this message, the story of feeding the 5,000 is very familiar to most of us. But the message is always new. The message is that God loves and he cares for every person on earth. That the promise of life and fullness extends to every creature and to every creation itself. God calls us to be disciples. We are to be the body of Christ. We are the arms and the legs of the church. God promises us, God promises us the Holy Spirit that the power, the love of God can break through even in the most unlikely places when we join together as faithful disciples seeking God's good intention for our world. Keep in mind, the events that took place on that hillside in Galilee were 2,000 years ago. Think about that. That's 2,000 years ago. That was a miracle to those 5,000 people assembled that day. However, the deeper message is the miracle of God's love for the entire number of people on our planet today. 
the miracle that we are called to be partners with God in making fullness of life before a reality today or is becoming a reality today for the whole world. God loves us. So that's the miracle that we are partners with God and making a fullness of life become a reality. We want to make it a reality today for this whole world that God loves in. That's why we're called to witness. Sometimes we forget that a simple smile, a simple handshake, opening a door, singing a precious song, hearing a precious song, just being a good listener is all part of being God's arms and legs to bring Jesus Christ into their lives. People are watching. May God bless the sharing of this message with you all this morning. And if you'll bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on us. Heavenly Father, we love you. Your name is love. Your nature is compassion. Your presence is joy. Your word is truth. Your spirit is goodness. Your holiness is beauty. Your will is peace. Your service is perfect freedom and knowledge of whom stands over eternal life. And to you be all the honor and all glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.